Well, good afternoon. Just a few reminders. Assignment two is the graphing assignment. It is due on Friday. If you need the grace period, let me know. Assignment three, which will be a uh, premise plumbing um, investigation assignment, uh, assignment, and that is due the following week. And then lab three, uh, lab one is due on the 15th. And weekly participation questions, don't forget, those are due on the same day. Any question about due dates? Um, The graphing assignment, I've posted a number of Excel spreadsheets for you to download. The data that you'll need are on the Excel spreadsheet and the document actually describes what I would like you to do in terms of the graphing. Major thing is make sure your graphing graphs are properly labeled. Label the axes. Make sure there's a figure caption below the figure. Um, Make sure it's readable. And if you have any questions, just let me know. So this week, we will start the first lab. What I want to do today is go over what you need to do. I have looked at your work from last week, and I've assigned <clears throat> each team a location. If you have any questions about that location, let me know. If you're not finding enough sites in that location, feel free to kind of move. If it's first floor engineering, if you need to move onto the second floor to get a few more samples to meet the requirements, then feel free to do that. So just to reiterate, the objective of this lab, and it's true for all of the sections, is to investigate the issue of corrosivity of water. You're going to measure. You're going to assess corrosivity, or really the degree to which a water is saturated with respect to calcium carbonate using the Langlier saturation index. And you want to relate this to the issues of red water. So when you're taking your samples, make sure you also record observations. Is the water slightly tinted in terms of color? Does it appear to be turbid? Um, so think about that in terms of recording, again, observations. For sections one and two, the kits <clears throat> that you have available You'll obtain from Joseph and your TAs. So you need to go to the lab. Uh, they, you should be able to do pretty much everything in the lab, although if you would like, um, you can measure pH and temperature out in the field. You're not holding samples for any length of time. So you could also take those samples and bring them back to the lab and do pH and temperature in the lab. Typically, if you're holding samples for any length of time, you would measure pH and temperature out in the field. <clears throat> Section three, the kits that you will need are the GH, and actually you'll only use the GH kit. You won't need to use the uh, KH. Um, forgot to change this. <clears throat> the KH kit is actually alkalinity. It is not carbonate hardness. And that was some confusion last year. And that's because the kits are actually used in, for aquarium testing. And apparently in the aquarium lobby, uh, the, the aquarium hobby group, um, alkalinity is referred to as carbonate hardness. The, you'll also need the Taylor K1004 kits for pH and alkalinity. Um, if your pH is outside of the range, the pH range, then you can also use the API Master uh, Aquarium 
kit, which measures higher pH, and you'll need the temperature probe. Um, the major reason why you're measuring the temperature is really just to make sure that the water is really hot and the water is really cold. So you want to make sure that you're taking the temperature so that you're running the cold water until the temperature equilibrates. The same thing with the hot water. You're going to run that until the hot water also equilibrates. So basically, you're trying to get hot water um, and cold water rather than a mix of hot and cold water. So <clears throat> when you're actually in the lab and you measure, if you measure pH in the lab, it will automatically measure the temperature and it will actually do a temperature correction. The same thing with conductivity. Does that answer the question? So I'm just going to talk briefly about hardness. Um, assume you covered hardness back in 280, but we'll talk a little bit about it. So hardness is a term that's used to characterize the ability of the water to ca cause soap scum, scum. So the calcium reacts with the soap, forms a complex, and that's what causes that kind of soap scum that deposits on plumbing fixtures in your, your shower tiles. So it increases the amount of soap that's needed. It actually causes scaling on pipes, which is what you see right here in the pipe. So this is a calcium carbonate scale on the inside of the pipe. That scale can deposit around valves that causes valves to stick because of the formation of the calcium carbonate crystals. And that can be a problem. You go to, you need to do some plumbing work on your home. You go to shut off the valve and you can't shut it off because the valve is sticking causes problems in distribution systems where they need to shut off the valves for, for instance, a water main break, but they can't shut off the valve because the valve is stuck open or can be stuck in a closed situation because of the carb calcium carbonate crystals. And those same crystals can also leave stains on plumbing fixtures. The hardness is naturally occurring. So especially in Michigan, where we have a significant amount of limestone aquifers, so that calcium carbonate can dissolve, that releases calcium to the waters. Same thing with magnesium. The actual structure is a little more complicated in terms of the dolomite structure, but basically this is the reaction that occurs that releases calcium or magnesium into your into the groundwater and then we have very hard water water in michigan in our area typically is categorized as very hard um, you will not do not be surprised if in sampling water on campus that you find hardness is exceeding 300 milligrams per liter. The test that you have has a linear range up to 500 milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. <clears throat> if the hardness exceeds 500, then you will need to do a dilution. So you'll need to dilute a one-to-one -one with DI water, which is available in the lab so that you can then measure the hardness level accurately and then um, report that, okay? You may find in some of the residence halls extremely soft water. And that's because some of the residence halls have either ion exchange units or reverse osmosis units at the point of entry to the residence hall, that removes the hardness from the water, resulting in extremely soft water. So you, you may find a significant range 
typically if you're in the academic buildings, you're going to find that the hardness levels will be high. You'll find quite different results in many of the residence halls. The total hardness is the sum of all polyvalent cations. So that includes calcium 2 plus, magnesium 2 plus, iron 2 plus, iron 3 plus, does not include ions like sodium. But for all practical purposes, the most common ions, polyvalent ions that you will find in these waters will be calcium and magnesium. We also divide hardness into carbonate and non-carbonate hardness. Carbonate hardness is that portion of the hardness that is associated with alkalinity. Non-carbonate hardness is that portion of hardness associated with ions other than the carbonate, bicarbonate species. <clears throat> carbonate hardness is often called temporary hardness because when you heat the water, it removes it. So for instance, if you look at the inside of a tea kettle, and if you ask Joseph to show you this uh, when you're in the lab, I think he still has the tea kettle. Um, and in the bottom of that tea kettle is this white precipitate. And that is predominantly calcium carbonate that becomes insoluble when it's heated and then deposits on the bottom of <clears throat> the um, water, the key, tea kettle also deposits on the elements in a water heater. And that makes that water heater less efficient. So as I mentioned, this is that portion of the hardness associated with alkalinity, which is predominantly bicarbonate and carbonate. The non-carbonate hardness is typically called permanent hardness because that is not removed when heated. So there, it's, it's more expensive to remove. It's that portion of the calcium and magnesium associated with chloride, nitrate, sulfite, sulfate, anions other than bicarbonate and carbonate. And it is typically, it is the total hardness minus the carbonate hardness. Now you can have a non-carbonate hardness equal to zero. So for instance, where your alkalinity is greater than or equal to the total hardness, the non-carbonate hardness would be zero. Now alkalinity is a measure of the ability of a solution to buffer the pH upon the addition of an acid. And it's extremely important in fresh waters because if any material, um, whether it's acid rain to an industrial discharge is received by that water body, that alkalinity is what prevents a significant pH change. So high alkalinity is able to better buffer against a pH change upon the addition of an acid, low alkalinity is less able to buffer. And in most fresh waters, the alkalinity is equal to the bicarbonate concentration plus the carbonate concentration plus the OH minus concentration minus the H plus concentration. And note, the units here are given in equivalence per liter. Same equation also applies if you have milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. So this is the equation we you'll use if you've got equivalence per liter or milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. In some cases, we have molar units. If that's the case, then this is the equation we will use. Note, we have here 
a two. Okay? That two corresponds to two equivalents per mole. Okay? So the two comes from the fact that carbonate can react with two protons. Okay? So two equivalents of protons can react with carbonate produce carbonic acid. So N is equal to two. So here, our units are in millimoles per liter or millimolar, or it can be molar concentrations. And implicit is a one here, a one here, and a one here. Okay. The result is the concentration in equivalence per liter. Now, at pH values between six and eight, the concentration of H plus and OH minus are roughly equal. So those two terms cancel. And if you look at this, these graphs here, so if we're between six and eight, the concentration of bicarbonate is significantly greater than the concentration of carbonate. That's in a closed system. Same thing here if we look here in an open system. Same thing is true. So because that is the case, and let's go back to this equation here, concentration of OH minus and H plus cancel because they're roughly equal. Concentration of carbonate is small compared to bicarbonate. And we can write that the alkalinity is approximately equal to the concentration of bicarbonate. Now notice the units, okay? I've, as I've mentioned, hardness you'll see typically is milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. You may see parts per million as calcium carbonate. In some cases, typically with ion exchange systems, you may see it in grains per gallon or you can see equivalents per liter or milli equivalents per liter. And these are the units you'll see for LSI. Okay. So <clears throat> when we, in terms of, you'll see this actually not for hardness, but you'll see that for alkalinity. So for both hardness and alkalinity are in these same sets of units for LSI, the units are equivalents per liter. The units for calcium are in the, L in the LSI equation are milligrams per liter as the ion. Okay. So be careful of that in the equation. And I've given you the equations in the write up. So hardness. So the hardness analysis that you will do is an EDTA, but basically it's a complexation reaction and you can see it here. It complexes with calcium, okay? And that complex is colored and that's what we typically measure. So I'm gonna play this. It doesn't have sound um, and I'll narrate this one some of them have sound, some of them don't. Um, this one does not have sound. So with this test, what you will actually do is you'll take a 50 milliliter solution. You're going to add one drop of the cal, <coughs> um, the cal uh, magnet, magnet, I, I can't, indicator. You're gonna swirl that indicator 
And then you're going to add one drop at a time of the titrant. And you're going to add that until the color turns from pink to blue. The blue is the end point. So you've got to keep track of the number of drops. And the number of drops times 20 is equal to the hardness. Okay. So relatively straightforward. Um, <clears throat> one drop of first reagent and then the second reagent. It goes through this. The instructions go through exactly what to add. Do this in the lab. Don't try and do this out um, while you're taking the samples. For those of you in section three, test is a little bit different, basically the same um, idea, but here you're going to use a methyl, <clears throat> a methyl orange indicator and you're going to titrate until the orange color turns green. So it's actually a five milliliter solution and you'll just add that dropwise until it turns from orange to green. For both of these, it's actually best swirl carefully. And in terms of looking at the color, it's best if you can look at the color with a white background behind you. It's, be it's easier to see that color change. Add it slowly, swirl. You'll initially, as it starts to change, you'll see a little bit, for instance, a little bit of green at that drop. You swirl it and it's going to turn back to orange. Add another drop, you'll see it turns a little bit more green. It'll turn back then when you swirl it to orange. You'll see the same thing with the pink to blue on the Hannah kit. The difference really is just what indicator they're using. The alkalinity and the original version was in Spanish, so I don't have sound on this one either. So you're going to collect the sample. You're going to put it in the vial, follow the instructions. The units for all of these tests are milligrams per liter is calcium carbonate. Um, you read this carefully because what you will do for, for this kit with these little, they're basically a little colorimeter or a spect little tiny spectrophotometer with a diet array inside. You're going to calibrate it first with your chemical. The way that this person is holding the vial, two things. One, no gloves. You, wear glo you need to wear gloves in the lab. Number two, <clears throat> Touching the sides of the vials like this leaves grease on the vial. The light shines through the vial, and it's the intensity of the light or the absorbed light that then gives the reading. And it's the instrument is calibrated previous at the <clears throat> supplier, the manufacturer. So Anytime you're putting little bits of grease from your hands, smudge marks, those can potentially be red. So when you're working with this, there are chem wipes in the lab. Before you actually put your sample vial into the little colorimeter, wipe it down with the chem wipe. Make sure that there's no smudges on the outside of your vial because, as I mentioned, Doing so can potentially result in changes of your absorbance reading, which means that your concentration is not accurate. So you're going to calibrate it initially. And then you're going to add the appropriate volume stated in the instructions of the reagent. So what the individual is doing is a blank calibration, so the zero. Essentially, you're zeroing the instrument. And you're going to open it up again. 
take the vial out, open it up, carefully open it up, add the appropriate volume, and that is a methyl orange indicator and a pH 3.1 buffer. So that buffer itself is highly acidic. Be careful not to drop anything. Mix it like this. Before you put it back in, wipe it down with a Kim wipe again. You've touched the outside. You'll press the button and it will give you a reading. And as it says here, it has an alkalinity of 111 milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. Now, with alkalinity, your waters at MSU will most likely have a residual chlorine. Assume it does. Okay. So you want to quench that residual chlorine before you do the alkalinity determination. So as such, you're going to follow the instructions, but you're going to add one drop of the quenching reagent. It's actually a 3% solution of sodium thiosulfate that Joseph will have made up for you. You'll add that to the 10 milliliters of unreacted sample and then add the reagent. I would suggest add that then zero your vial, then add the methyl orange indicator and the pH 3.1 buffer. So the indicator is actually in a pH 3.1 buffer. Okay, those of you in section three, the method is slightly different. This is a dual acid base indicator. It's got a bromocreosol green and a methyl red indicator. And what you'll do is you're actually titrating with sulfuric acid. So this is concentrated sulfuric acid. Be careful. Again, gloves, I, <clears throat> your safety glasses. Um, and what you will do is, again, you will titrate. So you start with a clear solution. You add the first reagent. The sample should turn green. And then you're going to add dropwise the sulfuric acid until it turns pink. And you can see it in the third image um, here. And you can see kind of it that initially you add the drop, it turns a little pink, you swirl it. Initially, it's going to turn back green. Uh, add another drop, and eventually it will stay pink. You want it just until it turns pink. That's the end point. Based on the number of drops, and there's a table in the instructions that will gives you the alkalinity again milligrams per liter is calcium carbonate. The pH indicator is a probe and a... The daily operation of the meter has been simplified to just two buttons. One is for turning the meter on and off, while the other is used to make recalibration. There is a third button in the battery compartment that allows the user to choose the display temperature you need. Just the automatic shutoff time. You should not have to do this. Temperature probe in cloth reference junction can be seen. The cloth reference junction is extractable. When there is a stability issue with the readings, the junction is pulled one eighth of an inch from the meter to expose a fresh surface. The extractable cloth junction offers a great benefit in extending the life of the pH electrode. The exposed temperature probe of the FEPS provides for a rapid temperature measurement in order to compensate for any temperature variations in the calibration buffers or samples being measured. This is absolutely necessary to achieve a high accuracy reading, especially with samples at the extremes of temperature and pH. To operate the meters, simply press the left on-off button to turn on. 
all the LCD segments are displayed. Then, the battery percent level notifies the user of the remaining battery life. In operation mode, the following can be seen. Instability indicator that disappears when a steady reading is obtained, pH reading, temperature readout, and, if calibrated, calibration tag showing which pH points have been calibrated. To calibrate the meter, press the cal button while the meter is on to enter calibration mode. For two-point calibration, the meter will prompt for the pH 7.01 buffer. Once the buffer is automatically recognized, the buffer will be updated and REC will be displayed, and the meter will then display pH 4.01. For single point calibration, press CAL key to exit. Save message is displayed and the meter returns to the pH measurement button. So that's how the <clears throat> pH probe works. Um, we have the pH buffers in the lab. Joseph and uh, Kayla and Emily will let you know next tomorrow or Thursday whether you need to calibrate. Um, I will also check with them just to make sure to find out if they've calibrated them or if you will need to calibrate the instrument. As far as that little electrode, if there's a stability issue, please let the TA or Joseph know. They will investigate. Um, there should be no reason for you to do anything other than the pH and temperature readings. For section three students, you will use, as I mentioned, the kits. Um, your measurements will not be anywhere near as uh, accurate or as precise. And you can see here um, the indicator on the left is from the Taylor K1. If your measurements are, or pH is between 6.8 and 8.2, then this will work fine. If it's slightly higher, so for instance, in East Lansing, you may find that the water is slightly higher if you were to do this at home. Um, that's because the water is softened and the pH, it's not unusual for the pH to be around 8.8 to uh, 9. So there, you might want to use the freshwater test kit, which actually has a high pH range. So it's got a different reagent. It has a regular a, a pH range 6 to 7.6, but it also has a high range pH. The disc meters are designed with accuracy and simplicity in mind, starting with a slim ergonomic design that fits comfortably in your hand in a high contrast, large display that is easy to read. The daily operation of the meter has been simplified to just two buttons. One is for turning the meter on and off, while the other is used to enter calibration mode. There is a third button in the battery compartment that allows the user to choose the display temperature unit and adjust the automatic shutoff time. The disk family utilizes an amperometric graphite electrode to measure both conductivity and TES. The exposed temperature probe of the disk provides for a rapid temperature measurement in order to compensate for any temperature variations in the calibration buffers or samples being measured. This is absolutely necessary to achieve a high accuracy reading as conductivity and TPS measurements are highly influenced by temperature. To operate the meters, simply press the left on-off button to turn on. All the LCD segments are displayed. Then, the battery percent level is displayed alerting the user to the remaining battery life. In operation mode, the following can be seen. Instability indicator that disappears when a steady reading is obtained. Reading displayed along with unit of measurement. Temperature readout. Calibration tag showing that the meter has been calibrated. To calibrate the meter, press the cal button while the meter is on to enter calibration mode. The meter prompts for the appropriate conductivity standard. Once solution is detected, REC will be displayed. Once the value is accepted, store is displayed in the meter returns to measurement mode. The meter is now calibrated and ready for use. So we have the calibration standard. Again, I'll check with uh, Joseph to find out if he'll have this calibrated ahead of time 
or if you will need to calibrate it. If you do need to calibrate it, you calibrate it once, take all your conductivity measurements and you're done. Um, <clears throat> there's no need to recalibrate during the lab, uh, either tomorrow or on Thursday. If you are um, in section three, this should be or some similar um, model conductivity meter uh, is what you've got available. And it measures, depending on whether you hit the mode button, it will measure uh, conductivity, TDS, or uh, temperature. So, um, and it looks like a temperature on the one measurement and it should be conductivity on the other. And it's in micro Siemens per centimeter. Okay. Uh, you, there's no need to calibrate this instrument. It's been calibrated at the manufacturer. So in terms of safety, read the SDSs before you're beginning the experiment. Make sure you've got properly fitting effective masks that you're wearing during all sample collection analysis. So as you're moving around in buildings, as you're in the lab, please make sure that you are wearing your masks, you're wearing them up over your nose and your mouth because I know all of you do that anyway. So please do that, continue and make sure that the math mask is effective. Wear approved eye protection, you want safety. <clears throat> um, glasses, wear gloves when you're handling the chemicals. If you need to go out in the hallway, you wanna go get a drink during the experiment, you need to use the restroom, take the gloves off before you leave the lab. You're collecting water samples um, unless you're actually doing something in the lab, which there shouldn't be any need to. I think it's probably easier just to come back and measure pH um, and temperature back in the lab, um, then there's no, you're just collecting drinking water samples. I don't see any need to wear gloves when you're out in the lab. If you desire to collect labs, uh, collect water in a sample, in a location other than a public restroom um, or a water fountain, Please ask, um, for instance, if you're on the third floor and you want to collect a sample in the civil environmental engineering kitchen, just ask, and I'm sure you'll be allowed to do that. Same with any labs. Um, back when we did this in 2017, one group decided that they were going to sample in a lab and didn't ask permission, and I got a kind of a nasty gram. Um, so please just ask. I'm sure anyone in those labs would allow you to take a sample, but just let them know what you're doing, why you're doing it, and ask permission. If you're at home, make sure you're working in a well-ventilated area. Make sure you're working away from any children, pets that could be harmed by the chemicals. And all of the waste solutions can be disposed of down the drain. When you're disposing of it, just rinse with water after you dispose of it on the, down the drain. <clears throat> so in terms of collecting, each group member will collect samples of cold water from at least four locations within your assigned buildings. The um, list of assignments is in the Lab 1 folder. You also collect samples of hot water. So just make sure the cold water temperature is constant. Make sure the hot water temperature is constant. <clears throat> you can measure it by feel if, or bring the probe with you and you can measure it there. Um, actually, actually bring the probe with you so that you know what temperature it was when you collected the sample. Uh, if you're in the engineering building and you're collecting there, 
it's probably not going to be much change from the time you collect the sample to when you get in the lab. <clears throat> um, record the exact location so that your peers in writing their labs, they will know where. If you were to go back and want to resample, you knew exactly where you collected the sample. Those of you in section three, you will collect your samples on four consecutive days. Same thing, hot water and cold water. So you'll do cold water for four days, hot water for four, day, four days. <clears throat> Again, make sure the cold water temperature is stable. Same thing with the hot water sample. Also, when you're collecting your sample, suggest flushing the bottle with water from the tap several times before collecting the sample. That way you know that what you're collecting really is representative of what came out of the tap, not what was in the bottle. So perhaps from rinsing with DI water, et cetera. Make sure you collect enough water for each measurement. You don't want to have to go back and collect water again. So make sure you know what you need to do. Go over the lab if you have not done so or if you didn't do it last week. Go over, make sure you know how much you need so that you have sufficient water. Again, note the clarity and color of the water. Um, and I've kind of waffled on this one, whether to have you take the temperature and pH on site. Um, ideally, that's what you want to do. Um, on the other hand, it may be easier just to do it back in the lab. If you're not transporting it, there's not a significant amount of time for that temperature or pH to change. Um, you could do it in the lab. In reality, it would be done on site. So if we were doing it for any sort of compliance purpose, we would be taking the temperature and pH on site. So for each measurement for sections one and two, for alkalinity, it's a 10 ml sample. For hardness, it's a 50 pH. A conductivity is about 20 mLs. You can pour, and pour your sample into a beaker and then measure it. You'll need to do the test in triplicate on one sample. So make sure you have sufficient. Again, if the hardness exceeds 50 milli 500 milligrams per liter, you'll need to repeat the test after diluting one to one. So again, think about how much you need. Your job is to go in the lab and tell Joseph, I need X number of bottles, and this is the volume that I need. For Section three, the volumes are a little bit different. So alkalinity is 25 milliliters, hardness is 10. Um, some respects, you have an advantage in that you're doing this at home. So if you didn't have enough water, you could just run the water again. Um, on day one, you're going to do all of your measurements in triplicate. And actually, you won't have to. I, should have deleted that. You shouldn't have to dilute the sample. And this is really true in the lab, whether you're at home or in, um, <clears throat> in the engineering building. Flush your vials with your sample before doing the analysis. Make sure, again, you want to make sure that what you are measuring is representative of the sample. So while I say you only need maybe 10 milliliters, make sure you have a sufficient volume that you can flush that file. Read the instructions carefully. Follow them exactly. Be careful not to spill uh, your reagents if you do. Um, we do have some access, but try not to spill the reagents. Be sure to write down your results in the lab notebook. You'll need to later transfer those to the Excel spreadsheet, and I will send out the link tomorrow with the Excel spreadsheets that you can share results. So for your data analysis, you're going to report the data in tabular form for the pH, alkalinity, total hardness, conductivity. For one set, you'll measure 
you'll determine the mean, the standard deviation, and the confidence interval, similar to what you did on that first assignment. You will then use the information to calculate the LSI. For sections one and two, I'd like you to determine the mean and standard deviation and confidence interval for each set of samples in a building. So we can aggregate that information. You could look at it from the building as a whole. You could also look at it from the floor of a building. Does it vary? So again, this is similar to the type of analysis you did in assignment one. So you can kind of see how assignment one now is linked to what you're doing here. For section three, you'll do that for the data from your home tab. I want you to compare the hardness of the hot and cold water. Did it vary? Talked about the fact of temporary hardness, permanent hardness. If it varied, why? Think about the theory. Compare your tap water results to that provided in the consumer confidence report. I've given you the link for the MSA, MSU report. I obviously haven't given you the link for section three um, students because I don't know where you are. Uh, and then evaluate the LSI results. What do they mean? Think about how do you want to present the data? What is helpful? I'm not telling you exactly how to present the data. You're presenting the data for sections one and two to the superintendent of the water treatment facility. What would be beneficial? What information would Mr. Silsby like to know? There's been a significant change in process over the last year. That can change water quality. Does it vary? Does it vary by building? What's the building age? Does it vary by the age of building? So think about this information as you're preparing your report. Okay. And think about, what, like I said, why there might be spatial, or those of you at home, temporal variations. What are the water sources and the treatment? The consumer confidence report or the water quality report should tell you what the water source is, should tell you what the treatment is. And we're almost done. So if sections one and two, your memo is to Mr. Tom, Thomas Silsby, who's in charge of the water operations. Um, and I've given you kind of a brief outline of what should be in your memo. Section three, it's a little bit different, mainly because it's hard to figure out. You're from different locations, so who would be the client? Uh, so I've done that in the format of, of a journal manuscript. Uh, and I've given you some guidelines in terms of what you would write in a journal manuscript. And then all of your reports should have scanned image of the raw data from your lab notebook, a couple photos of documenting your work. Uh, those of you that are in the lab, we know you're in the lab. Those of you that are at home, it's harder to know. So I'd like some photos uh, documenting it. If you want, take them while you're out sampling. And then include all of your raw data. So I've gone over by a minute. Happy to answer any questions, questions you have about the lab um, now, or if you have questions, we'll be in the lab. Um, I'll be on Zoom. Uh, Joseph, Emily, and Kayla will be in the lab tomorrow, so, or and on Thursday. If you take the pH meter, just be careful with it, please. Um, Hopefully these will last a while. We need them throughout the semester. Dr. Madison, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So realistically, we need four samples of the cold water and the warm water. And you're saying that we have to tell Brandon, I believe is his name, how many um, how many bottles we need. So wouldn't, wouldn't eight make sense? 
Yep. Do you need eight 500 milliliter bottles, 800 milliliter bottles, eight 60 milliliter bottles? That's what you need to think about. 